Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. We hope you have enjoyed your tea break and networking session. Now, in Symposium Panel 2, titled Science of Decarbonizing Cities, this panel will address how science can help address decarbonization gaps in the built environment to advance cities' net zero target attainments before 2050. Now, our first keynote speaker for this panel is Professor, Professor Arno Schuluter. He is the Head of Architect and Building Systems, ETH Zurich, Management Board Member of the ETH Energy Science Centre, as well as the Principal Investigator in the Singapore ETH Centre. His current research is on active and passive systems for the energy supply and climate control of buildings. His keynote speech is titled, Designed to Decarbonize, Effective Tools to Reduce Urban Building Emissions. Please join me to welcome Professor Arno, please. Thank you very much uh, for the introduction. Good morning. I'm happy to see you in this panel, the second panel on signs of decarbonizing cities. You've chosen the right panel. I think we have a very exciting lineup today of speakers, and I'm happy to kick this off with my little input presentation. So we are researching at the Singapore ETH Center, the Future Cities Lab, since approximately 10 years, and it's quite interesting to see how sustainability as a topic has advanced in Singapore since then. Um, this is reflected also in our research. We are considering how urban buildings can develop and how urban buildings can be decarbonized, and this is also the main topic of my talk. I want to talk about three things. First, the challenge of doing that, how to decarbonize, what are specific angles to this. The second, I want to give an outlook what we think could be helpful tools to actually achieve that. And the third, I want to give you some examples from research where we try to put these tools into action to learn Okay, how would urban design, architectural design be influenced by these type of questions? Now, I'm missing my slides. Here we go. All right. So, first of all, let's talk about buildings. I think most of us are aware of the contribution of buildings. 38% of global greenhouse gas emissions in total are associated to buildings somewhere on the building life cycle from design, construction to operation globally. And we know that a large quantity of those emissions is actually emitted in urban regions. And of course, then if we look, for example, in studies such as this on the left side, where 167 cities have been evaluated for the different contributions to carbon emissions in cities, we can see that the first, through, first three of those um, uh, parts of the plot are actually associated to buildings. We can see that in most cities, buildings actually contribute the majority of carbon emissions and, of course, should be a prime target if we think about decarbonizing cities. To the right, we see kind of a second perspective of that, um, and that's the good news. We actually have a lot of options, skills, and technology to reduce carbon emissions in operation. This is what we do already since, I would say, two decades, and we've become quite good in this. However, we're still lacking maybe the implementation of many things, but there's also another perspective, and this is what I want to talk about today, that is using buildings not only as consumers, but also as producers of renewable energy in cities. And to the right, you can see one study in Zurich where my home base is. I'm based both in Zurich and in Singapore. This is actually a retrofit building, and this looks like a normal building, but the interesting part about this is that the entire facade is providing both insulation as well as solar electricity generation. And no one would even notice it, right? It looks just like a standard facade. So there's a lot of synergies of renewable energy production uh, compared with other aspects of buildings. This idea of generating electricity in cities has been picked up. This is a, a statement from the Global Renewables Report that states that already a lot of municipalities think about incentivizing on developing policies how to decarbonize buildings through electricity generation, through power generation. And you can see here, this is a it's a very interesting mix of enabling as well as regulatory policies to bring these things into action. And of course, the flip side of this, the second part is the banning of fossil fuels, especially in heating-dominated countries, um, where you say, okay, you're actually not allowed to burn any fossil fuels anymore. And these combinations make it actually quite powerful. So just the banning of fossil fuels in, in Switzerland, for example, 
results in 70 to 80 percent carbon reduction of the buildings that we have. If we then add renewable energy production, we get very, very far in decarbonizing buildings. What makes this interesting and challenging, and we sometimes forget, this sounds very easy, let's put some solar panels on buildings, but there's actually really interesting implications on different scales, both temporal and spatial. So it starts with the choice of materials. It's highly dependent on which type of solar cells you choose in terms of life cycle, um, how this will perform, and on which areas of a building it actually makes sense to place them. This then goes uh, across to the question of components. So how do I achieve the synergy with, for example, facades, building envelopes, and solar energy generation? On the building level, we think, how can we utilize solar electricity best? It's a huge, huge factor how much of your self-generated electricity you can utilize directly in your building. That, of course, has a lot of dependencies to financial models that are behind of that. Then from one building, we'll go to several buildings, so a neighborhood, because you might share electricity. You can distribute among different buildings and utilize it best. And then at the end, the neighborhood is directly attached to the city, and then you are connected to larger grid infrastructures, if not even to national grid infrastructures. So if you want to use solar electricity in buildings, it's actually across all those different scales with very different demands in terms of space and time. Um, one approach, and we've heard it in the previous session, is of course digitalization and computational tools. Um, this is an approach we work on since eight years. Um, it's bundled in this tool set called the City Energy Analyst, which is trying to provide evidence-based means to do this type of decision-making and planning. And it starts with creating different scenarios, for example, of context and climate, weather files from 2050 that show us how climate actually changed, up to the point where we consider the available energy resources around the planning area, geothermal, solar, all these different types, to building form. There we utilize open data, open street map, for example, to generate automatically districts and, and cities to questions of estimating the demand. So very quickly, we can assess how much energy needs to be provided. And on the other hand, of supply. So what would happen if we choose among different techniques of generation? And at the very end, of course, we have to think, what does that all mean in terms of carbon neutrality? What is the effort I have to take for materials, for technology, and for operation to come up with a carbon balance over the life cycle? And what we hope with this type of tool sets, which have a, a huge inflow of everything we do in research and in teaching, uh, we hope that these tool sets actually help uh, to do this in practice in a different way. I want to show you a few examples. This was the, from the Future Cities Lab 2, um, the last phase where we investigated the question how much carbon could actually be mitigated in typical Singaporean uh, block situations. To the left here, this is a generated block situation and then if you take the carbon emissions of the, of the grid, you can identify on which areas of a building you're actually producing electricity with a smaller footprint as compared to taking this electricity from the grid. You can see, dependent on the context, that's a, a huge opportunity. Singapore may, maybe starts at 5, 10, 15 percent. Then if you go to Malaysia um, or other places, then it rapidly increases to 40, 50 percent of carbon emissions reduced by just using solar electricity on this building. This is another example. Let's assume you're planning a city and you want to have a certain share of renewables. Then you're immediately faced with the question, what can you actually do in terms of density and in terms of use types, in terms of occupancy, if you can achieve this share of renewables? So for example, let's say you want to have 30% share of renewable energy by solar. You can see here on the left that it immediately implies a certain density that you can achieve, so the amount of floors, floor area ratio, as well as the mix of commercial, office, and residential um, that you have to plan for. So in other words, if you don't consider this from the very beginning, when you plan a city, you won't be able to achieve renewable energy targets at the end. If we talk about solar generation, we directly have to talk about solar. This is what we're doing in the current Future Cities Lab Global with our colleagues. Marco Schlepfer and Francis Lee, where we investigate, well, actually, we would like to have this electricity at different points in time. We have to move it. We have to move it temporally and spatially. So this is um, using electric vehicles as an electric storage. The colleagues have assessed huge amounts of mobile phone data to generate trip profiles. And then we assumed that in times where this car would be idle, it would be loaded from solar electricity, and then it could be 
moving the solar electricity to parts of Singapore where it is needed at the very end. For example, here where you can see obviously the CBD, which could be supplied by a quite a substantial amount of solar electricity from electric vehicles in this process. Of course, also new methods are coming up. What is quite interesting here is using AI and generative techniques, so image-based techniques. This is an ongoing research where we utilize images to directly assess the potential for solar energy generation in terms of quantity, but also in quality. You can use these type of images to also then generate images how this could potentially look like. And this allows you to very fast do estimates on the solar potential of a, a city and, of course, of some aesthetic implications of doing that. Last but not least, we have to talk, we do all those tools, that's great, but how do we bring them to action? The City Energy Analyst has been uh, uh, accepted as a so-called digital public good, which means it's available as an, as an information equity. Globally, you can just download it, use it, and put it into your decision cycles and your processes to the right. This is an example that we used uh, in a case in Mumbai, in Navi Mumbai, actually, where we provided the tool. We had local stakeholders, uh, a local team that was doing the modeling, the analysis on the ground, knew the area really well, was discussing with the municipality and state level stakeholders to come up with analysis and assessment how to decarbonize this area of Navi, Navi Mumbai most effectively. And this is how we envision a process of these type of tool sets that we have local change agents or stakeholders that allow us to actually put this into action. I think this is what we have to think and discuss about. So wrapping up, um, action is needed. We have analytical methods. We have a lot of tools and skill sets to actually do so increasingly fast. Think of the next generation of machine learning based models. You will do this in an instant. We have to overcome silos. We have to be more systemic and integrated. And this requires new processes. We have to rethink how we collaborate, how we work in new processes. And of course, speed matters. If you look at the climatic goals that we have in 2030, we should be somewhere. So we better get started. But I think we're, very good. we're in a very good position to do so. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Arno, for your keynote speech on designing to decarbonize. Next, we have our second keynote speaker of this panel. It's Dr. Philip Roth. He is the Executive Director of LSE Cities, London School of Economics. His current research is on government systems, integrated policy making, and emergency governance in cities, and on sustainable urban development, transport transitions, and new urban mobility. As Dr. Philip is unable to join us physically today, he has kindly recorded for us his keynote speech titled Sufficiency, Justice and Urban Transport. We will play it now on the screen. Welcome to this short keynote for the Science of Cities Symposium this year. This presentation will focus on questions of sufficiency and justice as part of transport transitions in cities. The point of departure is one where we need to recognize that in the transport sector, we continue to have emission growth, regardless of all the great initiatives that are taking place globally. And we are also increasingly recognizing that conventional car use and mobility in our cities is incompatible with good urbanism. Both examples refer to something quite fundamental around sufficiency, about limitations and of scarcity in uh, political systems and how we navigate that condition. And that's what I would like to focus on. This point of departure relates to three archetypes of sustainability. On the one hand, of course, there is efficiency, where a lot of political action is taking place. It has two major problems. One is that the efficiency gains we have seen so far and we motivate it uh, through political intervention aren't good enough. They're not delivering the pathways we need. And second, we are seeing the rebound effect where efficiency gains are just used for more consumption of the same good. We secondly have uh, the consistency principle, and that's a lot about uh, the reuse of materials and the circularity. That's very important for our infrastructures and vehicles and transport. And thirdly, there is sufficiency. That directly deals with asking the question, how much of a certain good is good enough? How much mobility, how much transport is sufficient? And it relates to policy intervention that deals with limitations. 
And dealing with limitations is politically toxic. It on the one hand relates to the question what is actually enough of a certain item, of a certain good. Uh, and it has of course historically been used in many contexts of crisis, of scarcity, in the form of rationing. And on the right side you see sort of a depiction of uh, the rationale of rationing, trying to be more fair when it comes to distribution of something that is scarce. We have to ask ourselves at this particular moment where we recognize the limitations of actions in our cities and beyond so far not being sufficient, whether we can very much help questions of sufficiency by a clear analysis, by a more open conversation, by presenting better data and greater transparency as well. And ultimately also engage with this question about fairness of distributing a finite public good such as space or indeed remaining emissions from carbon. If we bring this sufficiency idea closer to transport, we first need to recognize that it rarely features to date as part of our academic but also policy related conversations. But it is a hidden component of many of the strategies that have more recently gained a lot of traction. The avoid shift improve paradigm very much initially focusing on avoiding travel as much as possible. Equally the 15 minute city approach, road pricing, congestion charging, low traffic neighborhoods. Somewhere, somewhere they do have always a component about thinking through what kind of level of movement is actually sufficient. But it's very difficult to define it then in more specifically about what is excess travel, what's simply too much and also what type of mobility should be encouraged or discouraged. What we also know is that any form of considering limitations in mobility and transport really creates very strong sentiments. There are concerns about personal freedom, self-determination, restriction, state overreach, there's status anxiety and loss aversion. There are even culture wars being rolled out in the context uh, of some city action at the moment in the transport space. And we always need to be aware that these arguments are becoming most powerful if they can be framed in relation to something being unfair or unjust. And that is really a fundamental point for a research program which I'm currently part of. It's a European research uh, program that looks at questions of fairness in the distribution of mobility resources. It's called My Fair Share. And I want to present here also a few initial uh, findings. The first one looks at the broader question of intergenerational justice and the degree to which people would actually argue that the well-being of future generations need to be balanced with the well-being of the here and now. What we're seeing here are survey results across age groups from, starting on the left here, from Austria, Germany, uh, Lithuania, Norway and the UK. And you can see here in terms of agreement and disagreement to this question of the well-being of the here and now, it's more important than that of future generations, that uh, society is pretty much split in these different countries and across the different age groups pretty much in, in the middle with some variety. You do see that older population tend to be more open to this idea that future generations need to be taken into account. But the fairness also plays out in the here and now exclusively. This is data from the UK just looking at uh, emissions from transport across income groups. And not surprisingly there is a massively disproportionate emission contribution by higher income groups and that of course is being increasingly recognized in these conversations. Fairness and mobility more broadly can be framed in many different ways and it's important to bring some order into those different uh, categories. There's procedural fairness, how we reach decisions, absolute fairness, there is proportional or sort of uh, distributional fairness where you start comparing different groups and substantive fairness. Let's again look into some aspects of uh, this type of fairness uh, in relation to uh, public opinions and public perceptions. Uh, and here an example of absolute fairness, guaranteeing minimum standards in transport or accessibility, for example in relation to jobs or services. And here we have quite strong fundamental uh, agreement and support with the statement that minimum standards 
must be guaranteed. There's very sort of few uh, disagreement, as you can see. Another example is a distributional fairness across uh, societal groups, where you could argue that transport may have to mitigate uh, unfairness or uh, un inequality in other uh, domains, and that again receives relatively strong support. And it's no surprise that, of course, in many of our cities we have cheaper public transport for the young or the old, for the unemployed, and that all speaks to making these kind of exceptions and correcting approaches in the transport sector. Now, if we want to operationalize some thinking about fairness and sufficiency, it's very helpful to go back to some fundamental frameworks. Uh, the one which we are borrowing here is uh, designed by Karen Lucas and her team, looking at uh, transport equity more generally, where it's quite important to initially consider questions around the benefits and burdens of mobility, then questions of social groups, and then uh, considering the allocation principle, which could inform the public debate. And I want to raise a few questions for future research in urban transport that will uh, be incredibly beneficial for the policymaking process. So first on uh, the benefits and burdens that occur from uh, transport and mobility. Key metrics and indicators need to be reviewed, upgraded, maybe adjusted more to accessibility considerations rather than just mobility or transport. We need to deal with non-passenger travel and also with travel that is intrinsic, where it may not be about the function of getting from A to B. For questions around the social groups, it is important to consider what type of um, criteria for differentiating social groups we want to employ beyond the standard ones. There are proxies maybe required to operate with these different social groups uh, for the political process, quite important because you can't disaggregate that easily uh, in many circumstances. And then also, once again, there is the data uh, requirement and availability that needs to be balanced off. And finally, there is the question around the allocation principle. Um, how can these be combined? Is it maybe not just one? Is there maybe also an ordering or a hierarchy where you start with minimum standards, which received so much broad support, and then you get to proportional equalities or other questions? And then also the uh, ultimate um, issue around minimum standards in the mobility space. How do we even get there? It's a debate which is quite strong and advanced in other areas of service provision. Think of water, education, health. The transport sector them itself has often avoided even coming up with what is a minimum standard. Many questions to address. Uh, I hope uh, you find this interesting and that some of you will maybe also become part of a journey of getting better and more robust data in relation to this critical aspect of transport transitions. Thank you very much. Welcome to the short keynote for the Science of Cities I'm sure Cities that was a very enriching uh, presentation. You agree with me. Next, we have Mr. Pradeep. Mr. Pradeep is a research associate and PhD researcher at the Singapore ETH Centre and NUS. His research focuses on the topic of urban digital twins and developing a 3D web application which will serve as a user experience dashboard for decision makers. His presentation today is titled A Global Bottom-Up Approach to Create Urban Digital Twins Mitigating Greenhouse Gas Emissions. Mr. Pradeep, please. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, hello everybody. Uh, my name is Pradeep Palwa. Uh, today I'll be presenting uh, the web browser application that we developed. Uh, on behalf of the research team, Martin and uh, Professor Rudy Stoos. Uh, basically, we uh, developed this application with a bottom-up approach, uh, relying on open data sources that is available to us. To set a context, uh, we have been facing various kinds of disruptions to built environment and urban climate, um, including heat waves, air pollution, flash floods, and pandemic. And uh, the image on the right here you can see uh, is a workflow of the researchers dedicated to working towards this, these kind of disruptions at uh, Future Resilience System um, in Singapore ETH Center. And I'm particularly interested um, in decarbonization pathways as part of my PhD work. 
As a motivation to the research, uh, you can see the graph on your left, uh, which shows the annual um, electricity consumption in Singapore, all the way from uh, 2012 to 2021. In just five years, you can see there has been an increase of 10% um, of electricity consumption here. As Singapore um, is a hot and humid climate, has a very high cooling demand uh, in um, residential and commercial buildings. Uh, this then also contributes to the GHG emission profile, as you can see on the right, uh, with buildings and household almost up to a share of 20% uh, in its secondary emissions. And this then also leads to a question why you have to um, account or mitigate for GHG emissions. This particular study uh, shows uh, documentation of around 1,500 academic papers. Um, citing uh, various co-benefits of GHG emissions. And uh, as per the study, we can uh, say that there are few papers written about energy security and correspondingly in uh, building sector. Um, this then uh, tells us that there is a need for more research on um, GHG mitigation in these areas. So our research on Urban Digital Twin and a tool which is dedicated to um, quantification of GHG emissions and its mitigation tries to fill this gap um, in acting in various domains in city planning with its smart city initiatives and uh, planning support systems, in climate and energy domain with its uh, GHG mitigation policies, and uh, in cyber physical system with its uh, digital twin concept. Uh, digital twin, as you've been hearing uh, this term, it's basically a virtual replica or a mirror of physical systems. It has bi-directional automated data flow between physical and digital systems. Conventionally, it has been used in production engineering domain and aerospace uh, domain, where uh, components such as automobiles and satellites have been uh, represented in order to study its uh, system behavior in order to optimize it eventually. Whereas the term urban digital twin uh, have been recently surfacing uh, in from past few years uh, and they are expected to help the stakeholders in uh, city management all within um, a user experience dashboard. And uh, we, as part of uh, research, uh, we um, propose a conceptual architecture in order to create an urban digital twin with a specific use case of uh, GHG emissions. Um, this image shows uh, the boxes represented in three uh, layers here, physical, cyber, and cognitive. Uh, starting from physical, um, you can see components here represents the built environment along with its uh, various life cycle stages of emissions. Um, specifically use case, uh, use stage, which mostly uh, representing the operational GHG emissions, which the tool is mostly dedicated to, uh, giving an inventory of uh, GHG emissions. And these physical components are then converted to a 3D model, uh, along with this uh, geometry, georeferencing, and metadata, uh, which we call a geoinfo model. Uh, assisted by a simulation system and climate data. This forms uh, data storage, which becomes a backend for a front-end user experience platform, where user can uh, input various scenarios, and the dashboard corresponds with the various charts and decision metric based on which uh, one can make decisions. Uh, we also came up with the, our own framework to create um, an integrated 3D data set um, where uh, you can rely on open uh, data sources. Um, and uh, we do this um, for Singapore um, as a case study where we have collected around 119,000 components represent, re representing the built environment uh, from sources such as OpenStreetMap, digital satellite um, elevation models, and uh, also relying on certain uh, open local data portals. And within the data set, we also define uh, hierarchies of city, uh, sub-city, and um, a building level, and all the way to component scale. Uh, we calculate the GHG emissions based on the collected historical energy use data that is available to us, and um, also create various scenarios in future um, using a simulation uh, data. 
Um, for instance, there could be higher or low uh, energy use in future, which uh, we can simulate, of course. And the image on the right you can see is um, a query result within the dashboard where uh, users can uh, filter uh, various planning areas, um, built years, and typology. So this is a short video showing how you can navigate within the dashboard, um, choosing various um, planning areas, build year, and say typology, say commercial, and you get a building stock query, and then you can click on each of these buildings to find corresponding energy use trends as well as um, GAG emissions for the same. So along with this, we also want to study further um, equipment-based uh, emissions uh, within these buildings. How is uh, quite complex and also um, have future uh, scenarios which can eventually help in policy intervention for decarbonization. Uh, these are the few uh, publications and exhibitions we've been having for the project. I'll be happy to take a few questions from you all as part of a panel discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Pradeep, for your presentation on the Urban Digital Twins. Next, we have Mr. Anthony. Mr. Anthony is a Senior Research Assistant at the Singapore University of Technology and Design. His research focuses on decarbonizing the built environment in Singapore through urban metabolism and life cycle analysis. His presentation today is titled Material Stock Service and Circularity Prospects of Buildings in Singapore. Mr. Anthony, please. Good morning. Thank you for the introduction and the COC for inviting me. It's my pleasure today to share the results of the research undertaken on material stock and circularity prospects of buildings in Singapore. Together with Professor Lynette Shi from SUTD and Dr. Mohit. My presentation will start with three phases. Firstly, with a bit of context on the carbon emissions at the building and construction sector. Moving on to the methodology, where I elaborate on how you quantify the stocks and the circularity potential, as well as, of course, the results. So with that in mind, let's start by moving on to the emissions in the building and construction sector. As Professor Arno mentioned, globally, this accounts for 39% of the global emissions. A part of that is the operational carbon, which is associated with the emissions with the building, operation of the building structure and its services. And the remainder, 11%, is embodied carbon. This carbon is associated with the emissions with the building material and the construction of the building. Now, despite the surge with green buildings, which lower operational carbon, Tackling the embodied carbon still remains a challenging endeavor. For us to be on track with a net zero building stock by 2050, this embodied emissions will need to fall by 60% in 2030, according to a report by the International Energy Agency. Our reason for that is that tackling these embodied emissions is more complex. These are not continued to the building itself, but are spread throughout the whole supply chain, from the raw materials to the end of life. And for an island nation, these supply chains are rather large and decentralized since most of the materials are imported. So a typical building life cycle looks like this. The raw materials are processed into building materials for construction. And during the end of life, the building gets demolished. A portion of the waste goes for incineration or landfill, and another is recycled, usually crushed as aggregates for the road construction, which is a downcycling application. The potential here is tapping into the stream of end-of-life materials from demolition to upcycle this into new building materials, creating this circular life cycle. This circular life cycle requires quantitative insights on resource use to convey how far can you close the loop. Circularity potential here, as we define, is the ratio between the available supply of end-of-life demolition to the construction demand. Ideally, you want this ratio to be 100%. But for Singapore, these insights were missing, and that's exactly what they attempted in this research. So we took a holistic approach on industrial ecology, 
First, we're starting with a bottom-up material flow analysis to count retrospectively for 2010, 2020, all the stock of materials in all buildings of Singapore. Considering for now, concrete and steel rebar, since our, these are the most commonly used building materials with a high emission factor. We further analyze the stock dynamics to see how the inflows, stocks, and outflows evolve during this 10-year period. This step requires data on building flow area and material intensity factors, which are mostly publicly available. This is a breakdown of all the building typologies considered in the model. So all residential, commercial, and industrial, differentiated by public and private sectors, and the 19 different archetypes, respectively. For each typology, we associated an average material intensity factor in tons per square meter. Now, finally, to convey the scale of opportunity for material recovery over the next 10 years, we build a cohort-based building demolition model. These steps require data on building lifetime date, building lifetime, which was absent for Singapore. So we used our calculated average building lifetime of public residential buildings, which is 33 years. Comparing to literature in the region, this is quite accurate, but we aim to refine it further to account for the other typologies more accurately. With all these steps, we can then convey the circularity potential. So moving on to the results, we observed that the stock has been growing exponentially, reaching 257 million tons of concrete and steel rebar in 2020, growing 3% year over year on average. Most material usage is by the public residential sector, which accounts for 41% of the building flow area here. If you count all buildings, three quarters is residential. It's quite remarkable. However, the highest stream of end-of-life materials came from the demolition of industrial buildings, since these are quite large compared to its counterparts. Respectively, embodied carbon is highest in the public residential sector, followed by the private residential, at almost 65 million tons of CO2 equivalent. 28% of this is with the private landed properties. This, in this second chart, you can visualize the scale of residential compared to the other typologies in 2020. We also learned that the inflows were higher than outflows, indicating that this stock will continue to grow since this is observed consistently from the 10 years And based on the reported rate of recycling, which 99%, we can then assume that currently 30% of the supply can go to the demand. However, there is no differentiation yet of what's downcycled and what's upcycled. So wrapping up, we observe that the stock has been growing exponentially. And with this, the cumulative material supply for the next 10 years can match 37% of the material demanded. This is a significant opportunity to upcycle these materials, but it's not enough. To tap into this high dynamics of massive demand and not enough stream of end of life materials, we need to reduce also the demand. So Singapore could consider a holistic approach where the current building stock gets its lifetime extended, seeing, for example, adaptive building reuse. And that future buildings are designed with adaptability in mind. In this way, Singapore holistically could move higher in the circularity ladder, reduce its reliance on material imports, and effectively address the embodied carbon of buildings. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Anthony, for your presentation on circularity. Next speaker, we have Ms. Dr. Dai Fangzhou. Dr. Dai is a research fellow at the National University of Singapore. Her research focuses on urban planning, transport planning and policy, urban economics and big data. Her presentation today is titled, Can New Urban Rail Transit Lines Reduce Car Ownership? Evidence from the opening of the Circle Line in Singapore. Dr. Dai, please. Okay, thank you for the introduction. Uh, hi everyone, 
I'm honored to share one of my empirical study, co-working with Professor Singh from NUS and Professor Delmi from Tongji University. So to control for the car dependency, many countries or cities have invested in real transit, trying to uh, change travelers' travel behavior, but in the existing literature, we find ongoing debates on the impact of real transit access on car ownership. And some existing literature, they face uh, certain methodological challenges, such as overlooking spatial and temporal heterogeneity. So we want to figure out how the new urban rail transit lines perform in terms of controlling for the car dependency in Singapore's local context. And during our study period, the car ownership level uh, stays around 10 percentage in Singapore. And the case study we use is the opening of the circle line, which opened in different stages from 2009 to 2011, circling around the city center in Singapore. And it is considered as a quasi-natural experiment uh, to assess the effect of its opening on car ownership. Regarding the method we use, uh, first of all, the data sets are from LTA, which are 2008 and 2012 household interview travel survey, one conducted before the opening of Circle Line and one conducted after the opening of the Circle Line. With this data set, we have the information on travel patterns as well as social economic uh, characteristics. And the main method we use is called difference in differences, which is an urban economics approach. And under this modeling framework, we have two tiers of difference. Uh, on the one hand, we have the temporal difference, which refers to the before group, before the opening of circle line, and after group, after the opening of the circle line. We also have the spatial difference uh, in this study. Uh, we define the treatment group as a household living within the 500 meter to a circle line station. And for the control group, we define the household living further away from the station areas. And with these two tiers of difference, we have the four subgroups here, before treatment, after treatment, uh, before control and after control. With these subgroups, we can do some regressions. Here is the model we use, the DID uh, regression baseline model, and the dependent variable in this model is the car ownership level. We mirror it by using the number of cars divided by the number of household members. And we also control for a few uh, household and individual characteristics. For example, the dwelling type. And for the individual characteristics, we use the income level age group and gender uh, employment status of a household head in one household. And to control for the heterogeneity issue, as I mentioned, we uh, for the heterogeneity issue, we mainly refer to two types of the issues. First of all, the spatial heterogeneity, which mainly uh, means the travel-based residential self-selection. For example, people who prefer to use MRT, they tend to locate near MRT stations. And this may overestimate the MRT effect. And another one is the temporal heterogeneity, which mainly refer to the transit-oriented gentrification. For example, after uh, having the circle line, the land and housing prices near the stations, they go up, uh, which attract more high-income households locating there. And this may underestimate the MRT effect. And we want to control for these two issues. So we develop a two-dimensional propensity score matching. With this, we match the treatment after group, which we care about, uh, with the other three subgroups separately. In this case, we can remove the demographic heterogeneity uh, along the spatial and also the temporal dimensions. 
From this figure, you can see that before the propensities go matching on the left, the two subgroups, there are some differences between the two subgroups. But after the propensities go matching, the two subgroups become more similar, more comparable with each other. And here are the main regression results. And moving to the main findings we have, first of all, we find that the opening of the circle, like it's a good news, reduced the co-ownership uh, level per household by 2.5 percentage points uh, in the treatment area compared to the control area. And um, this is the new evidence to support the effectiveness of the new urban rail transit lens in Singapore. We also find that the restriction effect on car ownership actually becomes larger after we apply the propensity score matching approach. This indicates that the heterogeneity issue do exist in Singapore's local context, and which bring downward bias to the results, and may be due to a transit-induced gentrification in the station area. And uh, we also find that households who live both uh, live and work close to the station area, they tend to own less cars compared to households who only live close to uh, the circle line stations. And after doing a two-stage regression model, we find that the opening of the circle line significantly affects the household decision on whether to own a car or not but its effect on how many cars they decide to own is not significant. And all the results stay robust after doing a few checks, such as the parallel trend ass uh, assessment and also placebo test. So with an improved method to analyze the effect of uh, circle line on car ownership, we have new evidence that supports the effectiveness of the circle line, and we believe that these results have diverse policy implications, and we can discuss this further during the panel discussion session. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Dai, for your presentation on urban rail transit lines. Next speaker, we have Dr. Chu Rui. Dr. Chu Rui is a senior scientist at the Institute of High Performance Computing under ASTAR Singapore. His research focuses on the study of solar energy and solar cities. His presentation is titled Significant Carbon Mitigation Potential from Installed Rooftop Photovoltaics in Singapore. Dr. Chu Rui, please. Hi, good morning. So thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, nowadays, cities take around 3% of land surface on Earth, but account for 75% of all energy consumption and 18% of all CO2 emission. So in this sense, actually, cities are the main benefit for climate change mitigation. Um, in this background, the Journal of Advances in Applied Energy actually has published an editorial arguing that the time matters for smart balancing of variable renewable energy supplies, maximize the benefits of energy consumers, and, maximize, uh, and uh, optimizing energy system integration. During the past few years, uh, studies have already suggested that uh, solar energy is effective for this integration or renewable energy transition. Um, to facilitate this process, we've already developed the concept called a sustainable solar city, uh, which is a sustainable power system to effectively connect and store solar energy and flexibly power a variety of urban sectors. So we developed this uh, concept, including six uh, modules. In the past study, I've already touched all these uh, um, six modules, but uh, today we want to focus on the last part to quantify the potential carbon emission for, uh, from the solar photovoltaic electricity generation. To achieve that, we develop a research framework. It has three modules. To, uh, first, we segment installed PV areas from satellite imageries, which has high spatial, temp uh, spatial resolution. 
and we use this by, by uh, we, we achieve this by using advanced deep learning based semantic segmentation network that we developed. Then, second, instead of just simply accumulating the total installed capacity, we estimate the annual electricity generation of the installed PVs. So this, in this case, the result is going to be more accurate. Lastly, we integrate life cycle assessment to quantify this uh, carbon estimation, carbon uh, uh, potential, carbon reduction potential. Uh, as a case study in Singapore, we utilized around 85% of areas for training, training this deep learning network, 15% for validation, and 5% for testing. Uh, the plots of A, B, and C in figure three shows the uh, rooftop areas con containing the, the PVs. Uh, B, the segmented PV area in the raster data format, C, that is a polygonalized PV area to regularize the boundaries. So there we achieved a satisfactory and even improved result by using the model we developed called the Deep Solar PV Refiner. And the benchmark is the well-established Deep Lab V3 Plus. I, I guess some of you may be quite familiar with this. So at this stage, we can visualize the spatial distribution of the installed PV areas in all districts in, in Singapore. So you're going to see that the two was uh, Changi Airport West Coast, including Zhirong Island, has the largest PV installation. Um, according to the statistics, which is categorized by land use types, we find that the industrial port and airport and residential area has the largest installation, taking around 45%. 14% and 8% respectively. For the arm, we estimate this uh, annual solar PV potential on 3D urban surfaces on the left side. The model we developed, which considers the influence of uh, cloud cover, shadow from surrounding buildings, PV conversion efficiency, PV installation layout, and, and uh, performance ratio. So in this case, uh, the spatial distribution pattern is a little bit different. You're going to see uh, uh, two hours Changi Airport have a larger proportion, while West Coast has a smaller proportion regarding annual ele electricity generation. It is because of the shading effects from the surrounding buildings in urban areas. Okay? Further, we modeled a life cycle assessment to check the spatial associated footprints of PVs during the whole life circle. It has four stages, including PV manufacturing and production, ocean and road transport, uh, PV uh, operation and maintenance, and finally, end of life processing consisting of uh, recycling and uh, waste disposal. Th further, we can calculate or estimate the carbon emission difference of the, these PVs compared to the local carbon emission factor in Singapore regarding the electricity generation, the grid set. Okay. Uh, and specifically, we considered uh, these uh, footprints according to the uh, PV market sharing data set in Singapore, mainly taken by the five countries of China, uh, uh, Canada, Germany, Japan, the United States, and uh, Singapore. You're going to see, uh, actually, uh, China and uh, Singapore, the two countries, takes more than 80% of, of the uh, PV market sharing. We also model the different electricity generation and uh, the carbon emission from two major types of PVs, which takes around 14% for normal SI PV and 14% for multi SI PV. Okay? Then, uh, to be short, uh, we finally get a result. It shows that in average, the installed rooftop PV can generate around 300 kilowatt hour electricity per square meter in a year, which will require around 1,000 megajoule uh, energy input okay, for generating one um, kilowatt electricity. Regarding the carbon emission rate, uh, the figure is uh, quite small. It's around uh, 13 diagram CO2 emission for generating one kilowatt electricity. This number 
is almost a 15% reduction compared to the previous study roughly three years ago. Regarding carbon payback time and energy payback time, it's getting shorter, shorter than one year. Uh, this is actually mainly because of the improvement of energy structure from over these five countries specifically, or a major com contribution from, from China, I would say. So these two figures, uh, previous study also uh, did this investigation in Singapore, roughly conducted five years ago, and the figure was around one to two years. So we can observe the improved carbon mitigation potential, okay? So uh, as a very short conclusion, I would suggest Singapore is one of the best cities to use solar energy. And uh, there is significant carbon mitigation potential from installed rooftop PVs uh, in Singapore, okay? Uh, we also have a poster uh, in the post station, and I'm very happy to discuss with you if you have any questions. Thank you, thank you very much for your listening. Thank you very much, Dr. Zuri, for your presentation on rooftop photovoltaics. Next, we have Dr. Kang. Dr. Kang is a research fellow at the FCL Global. His research focuses on the social economic impacts of distributed energy systems in urban contexts. His presentation is titled Accelerating PV Adoption in Singapore, the Potential of Advanced Energy Community. Dr. Kang, please. Uh, first of all, thank you very much. Thank you for the invitation. And it's my pleasure to stand in here to introduce our recent work. So today I'm going to represent our colleagues, uh, Martin, uh, Professor Fu, and Christoph, to uh, introduce our, our recent work. And uh, I think it's a very good arrangement for the organizer to put me right after Dr. Zure. The, yes, I, I still remember uh, the, the, the conclusion from Dr. Dury, uh, Singapore uh, is a very, very suitable country for installing solar PV, and there is a huge potential for Singapore. So in our work, we sub subsequently answered the question, how to achieve that, and what business model we need to use to fully unlock the uh, solar potential in Singapore. Uh, so first of all, let's look at some numbers. Two gigawatts, this is a solar target uh, from government in Singapore by 2030. And currently there is only eight, around 800 megawatt uh, solar installation. Uh, among them, uh, the private residential properties only contribute to around 3.8%. So we can say there is a st still a huge uh, space and the potential for the private residential sectors. And uh, this, is the mo this is the current business model uh, currently used in Singapore to uh, promote solar PV. Uh, we call it solar lease. Uh, and another one is uh, uh, ownership, but basically the framework is the uh, same. And today we are talking about uh, business model innovation called AEC, short for Advanced Energy Community. So this AEC, Advanced Energy Community, basically is governments uh, invest in the infrastructure like grid and the pipeline, and then a community aggregator will design the business model. So this business model includes the investment operation and even the price. They can set the price in this community. And finally, the end user only need to buy electricity from this uh, aggregator. So as we can say, this AEC actually is an integration of different solutions, including load pooling, energy storage, space utilization, and demand flexibility into one and system coupling. System coupling means the district cooling system. So integrate all this in one single community, uh, normally under one uh, same substations. And all these pillars will lead to efficiency gain in this community, and finally, this efficiency gain will boost the PV adoption. So what is PV adoption rate? So uh, here, 
it is, uh, we define as, it, as a ratio between self PV generation and electricity demand. Yeah, so we also call it self-sufficiency rate. Uh, so the research question we are going to answer is naturally, first, uh, first, how much potential AEC can bring to us? And secondly, uh, how much efficiency gain can be created? Uh, what are the sources of the efficiency gain? efficiency gain from AEC, and finally, does efficiency gain really need to increase in solar adoption? Okay, so we quickly go through it. So methodology, we use it. Uh, firstly, we, we, we simulate data. We use a, a CEA, City uh, uh, Energy Analysis, and we input into a multi-energy system optimization model, and we assess the contribution of all these pillars in CEA to boost uh, PV adoption. So the case study, we select uh, multiple district arrows in Singapore, including three residential sector uh, arrows, and two industrial park, and two commercial uh, arrows, and one university campus. So as we can see, all this community, actually, uh, they are in a building cluster uh, under one same uh, substations. And as a result, we can say, uh, you can say that compared to solar lease, the, the effect of, of AEC to reduce the cost, we call it LCOE, level rise cost of electricity, is significant, as you can say, in different areas. And the mean drivers, you can say, uh, they're different in different areas. This is quite interesting. Uh, but normally, the mean driver, uh, but generally, mean drivers is a load pooling, demand flexibility, and the system coupling. And because of the reduce in cost, uh, cost by CEA, uh, cost by AEC, the uh, PV adoption rate will increase. And we said another scenario if we uh, increase the feed-in tariff and the uh, uh, PV adoption rate will increase because the community will sell more electricity back to grid. And uh, as we know in the future, the electricity tariff in Singapore is going to increase. Yeah, in the future because of the carbon tax and all that. So we, we increase the electricity tariff to 40 cents per kilowatt hour. Currently in Singapore, the electricity tariff is around 29 cents per kilowatt hour. So if we uh, uh, further improve it, uh, increase it, as we can say, the effect of AEC is become more remarkable and can uh, reduce more costs and yeah, mostly from storage battery, yeah. And uh, uh, because of that, the PV adoption can be further increased. You can say in some, in the landed area and in the HDB and the condo, like 76% like of the demand met by solar energy and in, in HDB, 60% of the demand can be met by uh, solar energy. And we further increase it to 60 cents per kilowatt hour and we can say in some residential area, it can reach 100%. So 100% means fully self-sufficient uh, by solar uh, energy. So yeah, so the uh, discussion uh, we want to discuss is that, uh, okay, the outcome, we, we can see that the residential community, including condo, HDB, and the landed area has the highest potential uh, for solar PV, this is because they are high solar density, yeah. And uh, uh, to fully realize the, uh, the potential of, of AEC, the electricity tariff need to rise to reflect the carbon emission cost. And uh, another uh, driver, demand management uh, is needed, and uh, system coupling with district cooling is also, also helps. And finally, uh, the low PV uh, potential in commercial uh, areas is only meaning because of the limited space. So uh, potential improvement in space utilization for commercial sector is also very important. Uh, future extensions, uh, we can look into okay, how to further increase the demand flexibility uh, among AEC participants and how to connect different AEC together. Uh, through a P2P trade platform. And finally, how should we design this uh, business model to allocate the benefit to different participants?
Okay, so this is my presentation. Thank you very much.